On behalf of all of the participants, I want to thank you both very much for your presentation today. But let me just start by asking the following question from one of the participants. I believe that we are still living in a modernized colonial system, and this, of course, makes it hard to move forward and address trauma as it exists every day. Many of our people are still trying to come to terms with their own trauma. How can they effectively work in community if they still have not recognized or dealt with their own trauma? That's a very good question. And for me, in agreeing to work with Margot and her team on this, this is why we intentionally put this PowerPoint together the way we did, because we have to have those conversations within our own families, within our own communities, and they're hard. They're hard, that we, but we have to do that. If I go back to what I reiterated when I started, the elder telling me, Pat, you can never stop talking about this. And that's why we can't, because especially now with the reconciliation, we're hearing so much about it, but our communities are coming out of pain, and everybody needs to figure out how we've been impacted by this. So it's not something we can do overnight. It's going to take a long time, and it's baby steps within ourselves to be gentle with ourselves and with others uh, in our own family and our community on how we're going to work through this stuff. There's no easy answer on that one, Roberta. Maybe a follow-up question that came in was, how long does it take for a nation to heal from this kind of trauma? That's a good question. Again, it's 150 years or 250 years of the colonial experience. And imagine it's going to take a long time. Marco, do you have comments on that? I, well, yeah, Pat, I mean, it's hard to say how long that will take. Everybody's journey is different. Every nation's journey will be different. You know, I reach back in my memory. A decade ago, we wouldn't be having these kinds of webinars and we would not be having these conversations, certainly in the rooms that I was in. I would be having them in community and we would be talking about, you know, the oppression and the colonization, but we would not be having these kinds of conversations that were open and that we were looking at partnerships and that we were looking at those relationships and the interface of knowledge systems. We wouldn't even, uh, a decade ago, have not been talking about our own Indigenous knowledge systems. So I think one of the first steps is really by participating in these conversations yeah. and acknowledging, acknowledging the fact that trauma has rolled out, uh, we've been traumatized, and it continues to roll out. That's the first step of acknowledging this. I look to some of our youth uh, when I've spoken with them and many of their stories when they've talked with me. And it was when they went back to the land, when they went back to their teachings, that they started to heal. We're also in a time of healing. And it's almost, it's simultaneous. It's like uncovering the hurt and running to heal at the same time. And that's a very personal and a very collective journey. And, you know, everybody's going to experience that in different ways. Honestly, the more that people can gather together to talk about these kinds of conversations, to have the circles in their own communities, you know, with, start with your friends, start with the people you work with. It might be only two or three of you to start. And then it builds from there. So I don't have answers on time. But I do have answers on commitment, and I think that's what it takes. And it takes the courage to say, I see this. I want to change this. And, you know, we search and we look to each other to hold each other up. I invite Pat to come and work with me here in, in BC, and I go there. You know, we hold each other up, and that's what's important. That's the strength that we have. We have that in our community. And then we have the courage to stand together to start to look at these. I guess I would just offer those words and hope that they might resonate with some of you. They're certainly not your answer, but I offer that. Another question that came in was, do we know through history nations that went through these traumas 
how they managed to recover. I'll give you an example um, of Margot and I actually were talking about this yesterday. If you look at the work of Rupert Ross, Rupert Ross was a lawyer in Ontario, and he was dealing with our people in a community court system. So he would go out in the community and our people would be standing before him all the time. And he, he wondered, like, what's going on here? So he took a sabbatical from the Western legal system and he went to work with our people. And he worked with elders who helped him to understand this trauma, but more importantly, who helped him to understand the strength that is in our people in terms of our resilience and the strength through our ceremonies. So they started to deal with some of the abuses that were coming out and they built other systems, holistic healing systems as a result of that. So I would encourage people to look at his work, read his books, he's published papers and so there are good work that is being done in community where people are coming out of this pain. Roberta, I think there are some examples too where we look at the structural and big governance change levels where people have assumed authority over their own lives, be that through self-government or be that through self-determination through, for example, assuming responsibility for their health care services. And so there's examples of those across the country where people are becoming more and more self-determining around various aspects of their lives. And I think that's really important. And uh, if anybody knows me online, you'll know that I'm going to go to the child and family place because it's so important for building that identity of our children and the strengths of our families that we assume our own control over that. And so I think as we become more self-determining in parts of our lives, part of our healing too, and that's, that happens on a structural and systemic level and at that larger collective level, but it really needs to happen. And of course, we all know that collectives are made of individuals. So the healing is happening at individual levels and at the collective levels, and then we can make those systemic and structural changes that are so important and that enable us to become and realize our own systems more and more. Okay, we have a question that is a somewhat follow-up to what you were just talking about, Margot, which is what are some examples of prompts you would suggest for us to use to begin those conversations around historical trauma with our families? I think it's important um, to use our own teaching methods, to go back to circles, using circles, using our ceremonies, using our smudges, using our lodges to start the conversations around this. And there's all kinds of videos out there now that we can use to start conversations, a couple that come to mind that we've used the past system, colonization road, um, those two are quickly come to mind. And it allows for a conversation to start. Okay, I'm going to turn to some questions that have come in related to health care. One is, I'm a settler descendant. I have worked in health care in several Indigenous communities where the elders are reluctant to speak of traditional knowledge likely due to fear uh, related to colonization and Christianization. Have you any suggestions for these communities that have lost connection to their own ancestors' knowledge? What I'd suggest in that case is there are other elders out there that we need to go to. I remember back in the 70s, because of the history and the undergroundness of those teachings, Local elders had to go to elders in the states, and they learned from the elders in the states. They would come into community. And one of the elders that I worked with over the years would talk about that. Because of the trauma, because of the oppression, they had to go elsewhere. 
they did that, and as they did that, those memories and those teachers came back within our own communities, and we end up with strong elders who were able to recapture, remember, and put in place the mechanisms around those teachings to uplift the community. So as we find them, we're going to have to go to other places and spaces, but there are elders who can help. And when we have access to those elders, you know, it's amazing for me, in 2017, the elders that I now work with are actively talking about how we absolutely must work together, whether that's Indigenous or the other races, that in our teachings we all have places that we must come together and use those gifts for the collective lift. We just need to search them out. I think sometimes, Roberta, on those individual cases, it's really important that you're patient, that you establish that relationship. And it may seem that the knowledge isn't being shared. And sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it's a matter of people feeling, coming to that place where they can cross. Or like, it's almost like crossing the bridge sometimes where, oh, uh, you know, you come to that place where, yes, I can trust you. You know, um, and some, I know I've spent a lot of time where we just sit or we talk about the weather or the animals that we saw that morning or whatever, but it takes patience and time. I think that knowledge exists and comes back to us in many, many ways. So I would never discount that ever. And I'm not saying anybody's discounting that. I, I, I say that for myself. But I know sometimes it's just enough to sit beside somebody. Okay, we have another question that came in, which is one of the challenges we have is that we don't have Aboriginal patients reporting their concerns about health care through the normal system. They fear retribution and further discrimination. How can we address those fears and enable Aboriginal patients to report their concerns so that we can learn from and address them. So I can speak a little bit to that. I'm a great proponent of teaching people how the system works. So whatever system we're going into, if it's the university system or the hospitals or the, you know, the healthcare system, how does that really work? And beginning to understand that. So I think in our communities, we have health directors, we have community health representatives, a lot of times these individuals are act almost like our liaisons because they understand their community, but they're also very knowledgeable around the healthcare system itself. And if not, they know who to ask. And I think that sharing information about his, how systems works is really important. So I'd say that one of the things that we've done here in Northern British Columbia is we developed a complaints booklet that really is a very straightforward, step one, step two, step three. So if you have a concern, it walks you through how to actually bring your concern into that system. And it's very straightforward. It's simple steps. Now, let me say, too, that, you know, a lot of our elders or our old aunties, they don't want to do that. Like, that's a fearful place for them. But maybe their daughter or their, you know, that the health director can go with them because they can be there. They can be the voice for that elder if that would be the wish of the person. So I've seen that done. We have an Indigenous health team within Northern Health. And part of the role we play is doing that, you know, sharing that information so people know how things work, creating those opportunities for sharing for safe interfaces. And I think that's really important. You know, just to continue to do that, looking for those opportunities where people can and safe questions. I mean, we could visit communities and just field questions on what happens when you go into the hospital or what happens when you, when you get ready to come home, you know, and just really having those conversations. 
setting up those conversations to just have those questions and have people there saying, well, this is what it looks like. And then people can, from community can say, well, then what happens? Or how come it's this way? You know, it's creating those spaces for that opportunity is really important. And are there any directives on sharing Indigenous culture in appropriate and respectful ways with non-Indigenous audiences? Well, I can share some of the information that we have in Northern Health in uh, Northern British Columbia. We have what's called the Aboriginal Health Improvement Committees, which are tables. There's nine or eight of them spread across the North. And this is where people from the community, the health directors or community members, and other disciplines sit together. So you could have RCMP there one day or people from the school district in a particular area. And they sit together and they talk about health care service delivery. And there has been tremendous community input and activity on these local levels where they've developed resources that would be useful. So, for example, we pose the question, if I was a new health practitioner coming into your community, what would you like to know about me? What do you want me to know about you so I can serve you better? Right? Um, and so people respond to that. They've created DVDs about their community. They've created protocols. They've shared. And it's all been about what community wanted to share. And I have to say in the last uh, year, there has been where these little local groups have invited all the healthcare practitioners, say from the uh, Northern Health, to a learning evening or a learning day where they learned about governance, they learned about traditional economies, they learned about healing, and the communities put this on to teach these and share their knowledge on their ways with these health practitioners from Northern Health Organization. So it's, it's extraordinarily powerful, and these are partnerships, and this is privileging our voices and privileging our knowledge so that we can have those opportunities to share that. I think that's been really profound from all that I've heard. I haven't had the opportunity to be at one specifically, but I think there's been three that have occurred now just in the last few months, and people are profoundly affected by that because they didn't know that those systems even existed. How would you know? It was never taught in the education system. I mean, it's the same question the PhD had for Pat. How did I go through a history PhD and not know the history? So I guess we can't assume people know things. And so we search for those opportunities and those willing people who want to learn. And I think that's really important. And we share what we want to share. There is knowledge that will never be shared, but there's knowledge that will be shared. And then we make our own collective knowledge in this journey. Again, in a similar vein, there was a question that came in that asked, would it be okay to give this kind of information to our community members? And if so, how? And would it be re-traumatizing? Yes, our community needs this information. This is why we did this presentation, is for our community to understand what's rolling out in our community. And we have to do it in a gentle, kind way that our elders teach us. They absolutely need this information. We need to teach them. So we'll take a few more questions. One that came in was, my question is about any suggestions around how to start the movement in the communities to be more engaged in managing their health. I understand there must be challenges in the way the system is providing care, but I'm interested to learn how we can get the community engaged in this process. I'll give you an example based on my own experience. So my son is a medical doctor. What he did in terms of engaging our community was he went out and he visited our community members. He went out with an elder and they offered tobacco to our town site community, for example. And in doing that, what he did was he was inviting the community to come together in a pipe ceremony. And in that process, the community were finding their voice and they were finding a sense of empowerment that somebody cared enough to go and visit them. Now, I know that that's not 
possible in every circumstance, of course, but it comes down to us stepping out and going into community, visiting community, getting to know them. And in that whole process, what happened was a group of people who were often disempowered came together and rallied around the changes that they wanted for their own children within that town site community. So lots of things are possible when we step out of how we normally would do business into a sense of having a relationship with community. And if our people feel that sense of safety, they will invite others into that process. And then that starts conversations and then this health practitioner, that doctor, that nurse gets to be known within our community that they care and it formulates bigger relationships. So this last question is, hello, in the first article, historical and contemporary trauma was mentioned. Can you describe contemporary trauma? Well, you just need to look around our community and you see the rollout of the trauma, the pain, the addiction, the challenges with child welfare. That's probably one of our bigger challenges right now because in some ways some people think that that's the new residential school and that would be indicative of the pain that's rolling out within the families who are struggling with internalized woundedness, grief, unresolved grief, and it's rolling out in their children are having challenges. Therefore, those children are ending up in the child welfare. So that's just one example. And so those cases, are, I would think, are going to get more complex and more are going to come forward more as we start to have more general conversations around trauma and history in general. And so what I would encourage people, especially those in Alberta, go to the tribal colleges and the tribal universities because those are community-based training centers, places like Blue Quills University, Old Sun, Red Crow, Yellowhead Tribal College, Nietzsche. Those places can help around providing this type of professional development. If, and I would, there's some in BC, they're in... Saskatchewan, you know, reach out to them because they're there to help. So this concludes today's webinar. And again, thank you to all those who came out and participated. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Bye.